Hello everyone and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting and your host for today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone of a couple housekeeping details. Um, just a moment here, we'll move our <laughs> slides, there we go. Uh, please mute your mics. Uh, that will help minimize the background noise during our presentation. And also, I'd encourage everyone to join the conversation. Just one moment here while we pull up the rest of our slides for today's presentation. <laughs> there we go. Um, and definitely participate in the conversation. We have uh, the two foremost traffic engineers on the internet joining us today for our presentation, so I would encourage you to please ask questions throughout the presentation. As a special thank you to everyone who's joined us today, we do have a special guide called the Roundabout Primer, and we would encourage you to stick around to the end of the presentation for information on how to uh, get your copy. It is free for everyone who's attending today. Finally, uh, the presentation today is brought to you by uh, SPAC Consulting, which is part of the SPAC Enterprise family of companies. Uh, we were founded a uh, number of years ago by Mike SPAC himself, who uh, looked to develop traffic data collection products, engineering tools and services for our clients. And that group consists of six traffic engineering related companies, including Mike on Traffic, which many of you know, it's a traffic engineering blog. Counting Cars, an online store selling traffic data collection products. SPAC Consulting, of course, is the company presenting these webinars and is an online, uh, excuse me, a traffic engineering consulting firm. SPAC Academy, which many of you are familiar with, is an online store for digital tools uh, for the transportation professional. Traffic Data Inc. is one of our founding companies and is a traffic data collection firm based here in the Midwest. And finally, tripgeneration.org is our online source for free trip generation data. Feel free to visit out there anytime. The data that we've collected is available to anyone for free. I'm getting a few notes that there may be an audio connection issue. Can anyone else hear me or not hear me now? Is the audio working? We're good. We're hearing it. All right. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, for your patience. We've had just a tiny bit of technical difficulties. Go ahead to the next one. We do have a number of upcoming presentations. Every two weeks, you can join us for our Counting uh, Traffic Corner Tuesday schedule. Uh, at the end of May, we will have a presentation called Convenience Store Access. So join us for that. We will have some messages going out over the next several weeks on how to uh, join that conversation on May 23rd. And in June, we have an upcoming webinar on travel demand management plans. So join us for that as well. Finally, I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers today. And if you bear with me for a moment, we'll have a little interesting factoid for you as well. Get to our next screen. Here we go. Mike Spack is the president of Spack Consulting, and he is the recognized industry leader of traffic studies. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, past president of North Central Section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and he is a fellow of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Since 1996, Mike has led over a thousand traffic engineering projects. During the past two decades, Mike has founded four companies, including SPAC Consulting, and he is the creative force and principal writer of the industry-leading blog, Mike on Traffic. He is an accomplished author with articles published in industry publications, as well as several industry manuals that are used by engineers around the world. A fun fact about Mike is that he played varsity football and tennis in high school, and he was also a member of the high school quiz bowl team. If you guys need an extra team member when playing Trivial Pursuit, Mike is your guy, so just uh, email me at the end of the presentation. I'll put you in touch with him. Bryant is our Vice President of SPAC Consulting. He's also widely known in the transportation industry, having managed more than 700 traffic engineering projects. Bryant is a graduate of the University of Minnesota. He's an, in, an expert in synchro, sim traffic, vistro, and vSIM traffic modeling software packages, and he thrives on developing creative solutions to traffic and transportation issues. Bryant is a regular contributor on Mike on Traffic blog and a published author in industry publications as well as co-author of several industry manuals. 
An interesting fact about Bryant, when he was in high school, he competed in the hurdles event at the state high school meet. That competitive spirit is stuck with him into adulthood, and he now plays soccer in the evenings, and he holds the free throw record when he plays basketball in the office. So please join me in welcoming both Mike and Bryant to today's webinar. Thanks, Nancy. So Mike here and Bryant here, and I'm going to start off with an apology. It is uh, seasonal allergy time here in Minnesota. I will try not to sniffle into the microphone as I talk, So, um, but I'll apologize for that in advance. So today we're going to be talking about modern roundabouts, and uh, we're going to answer the question, are roundabouts a silver bullet? Uh, give some background on roundabouts in general. Uh, as well as go through our process for figuring out when we think a roundabout should be installed. Uh, first thing, key features of a modern roundabout, kind of the things that set it apart from your standard uh, circular intersection, the rotaries, that sort of thing. Yield on entry, so the vehicles in the circle have the right of way, everyone else trying to enter must yield to them. And then here in the United States, uh, we have counterclockwise flow uh, is the next uh, thing. So you'll see the arrows in the circle rotating. Uh, that's actually opposite, though, uh, to our friends who drive on uh, the other side of the road. Key piece there is that people aren't cutting in front of the roundabout. They're not making a left on the short path. They have to go around the circle, whichever way you're driving. Uh, and then the last feature is their low speeds. Uh, so here in the United States, we've had roundabouts for a long time. They're typically called rotaries. Uh, but the rotaries out on the East Coast were huge, uh, sometimes uh, a football field across. And, and that allowed people to get up to 30, 40 miles an hour as they were going around the roundabout. A uh, key feature now is we try to tighten up the speed so everyone's uh, going kind of in a few mile per hour band. Uh, we designed the geometry of the roundabout to try to get them to go roughly 18, 22 miles an hour. Roughly in that, yes. So hitting some benefits, kind of the primary benefits of the roundabouts as we look at them. First one is safety. This, there's been a lot of studies. This one came from MnDOT where they found uh, single lane, at least, studies. All crashes went down. Uh, you can see it on the chart there, 39%. Injury crashes way down. Fatal crashes almost eliminated. So, um, again, this is for single lane, but just shows how much of a, a safety improvement they can be over I'll call them traditional intersections. Yes, and this mirrors some of the earlier statistics uh, from a decade ago. Uh, the uh, insurance folks put out that roundabouts reduce fatal crashes about 90%. Uh, Tony Trammell uh, put in the fact that, yes, those, those old rotaries, they are not modern roundabouts, uh, but people still confuse them and call them roundabouts. And the point with the last slide was to kind of talk about the key features of modern roundabouts with the key word being modern. Um, so in addition to safety, next benefit is the efficiency. Uh, roundabouts in many cases perform as well as a traffic signal with less delay for moving traffic through the intersection. But more importantly, I, I don't know how many times I've come to a left turn lane, a protected arrow in the middle of the night that's red, and I have to sit there for 30 seconds and just get frustrated that the signal timing isn't snappier. Well, at a roundabout, you don't have that kind of delay. So they really uh, typically perform a lot better uh, than traffic signals when you get outside of the peak hours and, of course, uh, typically perform better than an always stop condition. Environmentally friendly, it goes right along with the delay. If you have less delay, you have less idling, you're getting the cars moved through faster, just less pollution overall. So again, pairs with the efficiency, but environmentally friendly. Uh, and not only environmentally friendly with less pollution, but also typically there's less pavement at the intersection than a large traffic signal with turn lanes, 
which has the benefit of less runoff, uh, and also you yep. can control the runoff in the right of way within the roundabout to clean up the water. Access management can be another good benefit, and this is primarily where you're using the roundabout to complete a U-turn to get back to an adjacent driveway or intersection that might be reduced to three-quarter or right in, right out. So the, the roundabout is a great way to pair those together so people can get back to that driveway and they feel that it's an easy move to complete. And the fifth benefit here is traffic calming with the series of roundabouts and if we're designing them properly so all of the motorists going through the roundabouts are going about 20 miles per hour it does have a calming effect on the whole corridor. Last one we have is aesthetics and nice picture here if you if you hand it over to a landscape architecture they can create a unique space and do a lot of things with that middle island it goes Right along with less pavement, we've just got area to make it a little bit unique, add a little flavor to an intersection. Yeah, I've even done blog posts on Mike on Traffic where I've highlighted my top 12 or 20 favorite <laughs> roundabout yeah. designs, uh, especially over in Spain. Uh, they go pretty crazy with putting things in the middle of the roundabouts. Um, so since we're talking about our roundabouts, a silver bullet, uh, We'll, we'll give you some of the limitations <laughs> of roundabouts. Uh, the first one being there's no priority at the intersection. So with the traffic signal, you can time a, a mainline corridor to get platoons moving through uh, without having to stop during rush hours, and that's obviously a benefit. Uh, you don't have that kind of control with roundabouts. And in fact, if you have the heavy, if you have a minor movement coming in, it can actually take over a major movement if they're coming to the left of the major movement, mm -hmm. which can cause pretty significant queuing. Other things along with priority, uh, no emergency services, so they can preempt the signal to get through an intersection quicker. That can't happen in a roundabout. And you can also customize the signal for event traffic if... Uh, football game lets out near a high school or something like that, you can customize it to the traffic that comes through. Obviously with a roundabout, it's there, it just deals with the traffic as it comes, no customization. Next is a common phrase with roundabout design is skinny roads, wide nodes, that the footprint at the roundabout, the actual intersection, you can see in red on the image on the left, you end up typically those corners do become bigger with more pavement going out, but you don't have the turn lanes, especially kind of if you're replacing an intersection with dual left turn lanes with, a round, with just a two-lane roundabout, you don't end up with the very wide road leading up to it and stretching back five, six hundred feet by the time you get the turn lanes and the mm -hmm. taper in. So often they're actually less pavement, but at the intersection you need more right-of-way. Driver education can be a key issue, particularly for communities that uh, don't have any roundabouts, and that becomes a key piece uh, if you're looking in those communities of what you're trying to do. There is a learning curve associated with them. With single lane roundabouts, it's not so much. Generally, drivers go through it once or twice. They're easy to understand. You just make a decision, you either go or you don't go. So single lane, that curve is pretty quick, just a couple times through and most drivers will get it. It's the multi-lane roundabouts where this really comes in and how people understand uh, they have to be in the correct lane, know where they're going, get into that lane in advance of the intersection and then stay in their lane as they move through the intersection. So that can be a, an education process and a learning curve for the driver. And our experience typically is that we see when roundabouts go in, it can take weeks, even a few months, but after about half a year with a multi-lane roundabout, it seems like they're getting to be driven close to efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and as you get more roundabouts in an area, obviously people become more comfortable with them. And we're also seeing younger folks are more comfortable about them. They're learning about roundabouts and driver's ed and actually going out 
and driving them. So it's mostly us older folks <laughs> that, yeah, that that's a good point. Have yeah. the learning curve here. Sight impaired. This is this is actually a really big issue as we try to figure out how ADA compliance mixes in with roundabouts. Uh, with the continual movement of traffic, not the start and stop that you have at a signal, it can become very difficult for a, a blind pedestrian to cross the intersection. Just how does that happen if they've got traffic whizzing by them in all directions and no clear audio clue of when traffic has stopped and when they can cross? So in over in Britain, they've started putting in traffic signals at the approach of each roundabout to help to basically give pedestrian crossing to turn traffic red and let the pedestrians cross for the sight impaired. Uh, this is expensive <laughs> and would really change the landscape if we had to do that at every roundabout in the United States. Um, I think it would really cut down on the amount of roundabouts we put in. Yeah, and that's, there is, um, last I heard about it, there are a couple different advocates for the blind that were almost duking it out as to whether they wanted signals required at roundabouts or not. So I think this is an issue that everyone needs to keep an eye on because uh, if rules are ever issued for it, it could fundamentally change how, how we uh, look at roundabouts and where we put them. So uh, another big limitation is when Bryant was talking about at events, football games, those kinds of things, that traffic signals, even though there's delay associated with them, they eventually get everybody through the intersection in a reasonable time frame. Uh, at a roundabout, it is static, and if it gets to gridlock, uh, it is at gridlock, and getting it unwound take significant time of people jockeying back and forth. So that is one area where a traffic signal has an advantage over a roundabout. Yeah, we, we like to put it, roundabouts work well, they work well, they work well, they work well, and then they're broke. Um, so there, <laughs> there's really no slight curve like there is for a signal where it just gradually gets worse. This, this is just a catastrophic, it works and then it doesn't. Yeah, much more pass-fail. Uh, then lastly, cost. Uh, if you're working out in a farm field, uh, naked land, uh, putting in a traffic signal with turn lanes is roughly the same cost as putting in a roundabout. But if you're coming in and retrofitting an existing intersection, roundabouts can cost two, three, four times more than putting in a signal in a couple of turn lanes. Um, at smaller intersections, though, uh, we've recently written about mini roundabouts, and the FHWA is testing those out more and more. They seem mm -hmm. to work great as small, single-lane roundabouts, so obviously not your big intersections, but the costs on those are coming in comparable to putting in a traffic signal, uh, especially if you're adding a couple of turn lanes. It also gets you away from the uh, right-of-way issue because of the smaller size. So you may not need, uh, definitely not as much as a full-size roundabout, and sometimes you can even fit that within the existing right-of-way. Yep. So here's the verdict. Uh, we're going to pull up some different quotes. We're not going to read them, but uh, first off, uh, ARP. Uh, uh, what does ARP stand for? AARP. Yeah, yeah. but it's... It's Senior Association Citizen Re Association, Re retired, which my mom will smack me upside the head for saying that. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, ARP is a believer in them and that they enhance the quality of life for all. We've all seen the stats from the Insurance Institute. They've been around for a while, and they continue to promote roundabouts, improve traffic flow, better for the environment. And uh, along with them, I would say, as autonomous vehicles are coming, that roundabouts are really easy for an autonomous vehicle to handle, uh, that they only have to basically look to the left and look for a single gap. So I think as autonomous vehicles are driving roundabouts, we're going to see even more ca more capacity. Uh, we're going to push, push the saturation flow rates on a roundabout, yep. uh, where with a signal you automatically have lost time with the yellow and red. Uh, so, yeah, theoretically in a roundabout, you could have four cars enter the intersection from each approach at one time. 
Right. Which None humans of them are going to interfere which with each humans other. aren't great at, but the autonomous vehicles will really push the envelope on that. Uh, ITE, obviously a, a big one. Traffic engineers, they've been behind roundabouts. They've got subcommittees, a lot of work they do promoting and, and frankly, on the research, too, making sure we understand the latest about their operations, safety, all those factors. So big believer uh, coming from ITE. Yep. And then lastly, the other side uh, from us planners and engineers are the folks actually building the roads, uh, and they're a believer in roundabouts as well. Uh, so across the board, many, many folks <laughs> uh, are in favor of roundabouts. Uh, but again, we're talking about are they uh, a magic answer for us here? Are they a silver bullet? So just to foreshadow, the answer is no. <laughs> um, but we're going to run through our quick process of when we analyze an intersection. Uh, let's put it this way. The roundabouts, they may not be the silver bullet, but they're as close as we've got right now. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, so first, going through, especially at least in Minnesota, the default process and what we've seen around the country is run through a typical warrant analysis per the manual on uniform traffic control devices. Uh, so we typically run both traffic signals and always stop warrants. Uh, look at peak hour as well as the eight hours, the four hour, all the warrants. Um, and if a si <laughs> we hope that they will come up with warrants for roundabouts, but they haven't yet. But here in Minnesota, we default to if it meets the signal warrants, we apply those to roundabouts, not the always stop warrants. Although, in my opinion, well, roundabout could, warrants should be in the middle yeah. or even down to an always stop and, warrant. And we should say for this process, as we go through these things, what we're really looking for are either uh, green lights that say, yes, this is great, put it in, or red flags that say, hey, you need to think about this a little bit more. So it's kind of, you're looking for that either or, yep. good and bad. So warrants would be one that if we meet it, good, we can go. If it's not, then it's a flag, but not necessarily something um, yep. that stops it. Yep. We'll do a quick crash analysis, look at rates, look at types. Obviously, the safety benefits of roundabouts are well known. Left turn crashes in particular. Yep. And, and on. the inju injury and fatal crashes. Yep. Um, Operations volumes, we'll, of course, do our capacity analysis looking at the peak hours, but also recognize... We won't do capacity analysis on the off hours, but that certainly gets weighed into our decision. This is where you can also look at the volumes for the balance between approaches. They work better if they're balanced. Again, it's not a you can't you don't necessarily throw it away if you have an unbalanced intersection, but it's a red flag that you need to consider more carefully. Um, next up would be location. Obviously, if you're in a historic downtown with 200 year old buildings on each corner you're probably not going to be knocking down a historic building to put in a roundabout so there can be some disqualifiers uh, depending on what's on the corners and do you have the right of way there. Location can also refer to the community if this is the first time a community has a roundabout you need to make sure you're putting in the correct spot you want the first one to be successful so that you get yep. more of them. Yeah. Bryant has spent a lot of time bringing roundabouts to Mankato, Minnesota, and that was key to making sure the first few operated really well mm -hmm. uh, to get the community on board. Um, and then we talked about right-of-way adjacent intersections. These can be pros or cons in favor of the right-of-way, in favor of the roundabout. Uh, if there are close intersections, usually roundabouts work better. Um, you can con even convert those to right of right in, right out, three-quarter access, and the system will still work. Uh, if there are big utilities that would have to be re relocated because yep. of a roundabout, because the corners are expanding, that might be a disqualifier. Um, other things, if your adjacent intersection has a queue spillback that would interfere with the roundabout operations, that's something to consider. If you're in the middle of a signal corridor, that could be another one. You might get better operations recognizing that there's vehicle platoons that are coming through mm -hmm. and the, the roundabout may not handle those as well. Yeah, or if you're right on top of railroad tracks 100 feet away from the yeah. intersection, yeah. Uh, roundabouts are typically not a good idea. You've you seen want, them occasionally, but, but that's a, you're much, <laughs> it's a safer operation to have a signal with preempt that ties uh, 
connects to the railroad. And then we get into unique features such as skewed intersections, intersections with more than four lanes getting up to five or six lanes, and those can go both ways for roundabouts, yep. so you just have to look at the analysis. So we uh, kind of moved fast there at the end. We wanted to save a little bit of time uh, for questions, so please type in any if you have any. Uh, Bryant uh, stumbled upon a great, helpful website here by FHWA. We encourage you to look at for more information about roundabouts. It looks yeah. like they're spending a lot of time keeping that site up to date with current research and inf very Yeah, they've got links. They've got some brief information, kind of like this webinar, but then they've got links to a ton of different things. So I encourage okay. people to check that out. Okay. Uh, we have how do roundabouts perform when coupled with traffic signals, examples of DuPont Circle in DC. Um, I don't think there is a cookie cutter answer. It depends on the traffic flows. Do you have a heavy commuter pattern through? As Bryant was mentioning, if you have a heavy commuter pattern going down a couple mile corridor, you're probably better off with traffic signals. But in DC, if I'm remembering DuPont Circle correctly, I think it's much more of a grid pattern without that kind of commuter pattern. I thought DuPont Circle was more of a rotary too. Yeah. I don't know that it's a modern roundabout, so there's some differences there, but uh, um, they could work more in that situation where it's not as, where you're not trying to get a platoon through for miles. England has used traffic signals in some high, uh, high volume roundabouts, and they, they say they get some good capacity out of using them, just allowing people to take those turns. Um, they're just, we really just don't have the experience in the U.S. Okay. Let's get through our last couple of slides here before we get to more questions. Uh, we do have a primer we've put together, four or five pages for you. Everything in this presentation plus more about roundabout design uh, and analysis. Uh, feel free to text 44222 Traffic Corner and we'll get you the guide or email Nancy Encrow at SPACConsulting.com. And then also, uh, we do have a spreadsheet that implements uh, the HCM methodology. Uh, if you do need to get into roundabout analysis but don't want to buy the bigger software packages, it's pretty easy to use the spreadsheet. Uh, you can go to SPACAcademy.com and type in RCA deal uh, and that will run through the end of the month. Yep. And that is for three or four-legged intersections. We don't, we don't have that to create those SOG five or six legs, but um, it does a good job of <clears throat> quickly analyzing that. Okay, uh, so let's get back to the questions. Roundabouts in residential areas. Leave that there for people if they want to text. Okay, uh, uh, how close can driveways be in residential areas to roundabouts? And my opinion is they can be really close. Uh, I, I wouldn't want them 20 feet away, but Certainly 100 feet away would be acceptable in my mind. Well, the benefit you have for the roundabout is traffic's, they're slow going into them, slow coming out of them. So you can get closer than you could at a signal. A uh, key question there would be whether you're trying to get a full access driveway or if you're okay with the right in, right out and putting it um, by the uh, splitter island mm -hmm. in there. Yep. So you definitely need the splitter islands, uh, at least for the full size roundabouts. And so um, the driveway could be there if you're okay with the right in, right out. Yep. Uh, Andy asks, what have you found is capacity and or volume threshold where a roundabout breaks down? Whew. Um, that just got jumped up with the latest research for the, the new highway capacity manual, and I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, that's something we can follow up on this one, though. We can... Uh, look that up, we'll send it out with the Yeah, uh, it's, with the it's usually related to the circulating volume within the roundabout um, is one way to look at. Yeah, you can look at it on a per lane entry and I mean you're really looking at the cross product of the um, of the entry versus the circulating. I mean those that's that's the two you're looking at and, and what's that cross product. Uh, again, I just don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, could some of the features and considerations be similar to mini circle applications? Um, 
if by mini circle you mean the mini roundabouts that still have kind of the same design principles as a modern roundabout, which would really the key features are uh, you have splitter islands, you have yield, yield, yield entry, entry, and you have design speeds based on geometry about 20 miles an hour. Um, those, um, all of this applies to those. Little traffic circles in neighborhoods with stop signs on the approaches, I'm not as big a fan of those, um, so I would say no. The, those are usually a traffic calming item that are just plunked in to try to slow traffic down. In uh, they're harder to maneuver for trucks. There's some other issues with them. Okay. We are at 1 o'clock, so I'm going to say thanks to everybody for attending. We're still going to answer all your questions, but uh, just for those who have to go, thank you very much for attending. Please feel free to get our guide and our, and our discount on the roundabout analysis, yep. and we will answer that one question and send stuff out. So for those who want to hang with us, we've still got a few more questions that yep. will... And we'll, we'll keep going. So if you if you've got more to ask, yeah, uh, we'll feel stay free. on as long as you guys have questions. Okay. Wow, they're Whoa, rolling in. Look at that. <laughs> uh, what's the best way to educate the public on how to use a roundabout? Uh, a lot of public meetings, websites with videos. Uh, here in Minnesota, we've come up with basically different carpets or boards with roundabouts on them, and let people move little matchbox cars around them. That's it's been a great one. Try, yeah, that's been a great one. Basically create a plan, a big plan sheet with the roundabout and move match cars around it. Yeah, match you make it to cars. scale, you make it to the 164th or whatever the Hot Wheel car yeah. thing is, and then people can demonstrate situations and you can demonstrate situations. It's it's a great tool. Um, it's, it's really just getting them to understand you, they have to look to their left, and when they have a gap, they go. <laughs> That's just the big thing uh, in my experience. I think a key thing, too, for education is going where people are. Uh, don't expect people to come to you if you hold it at City Hall. You'll get a few, obviously, but it's much better if you go to the local grocery store. You can hang out. We've done that where we've hung out in front of a grocery store, and uh, we capture people coming in and out. You put some treats on there, you get the kids over, the adults will follow too, and you can engage them that way. So yep. try to think of it in, in line or go to your, those lines. Or to your county fairs, your state fairs. Yep. Uh, we've had successful booths um, to go through that kind of stuff. What do you think of slip lanes that take the traffic out of the roundabout? Uh, certainly a design element. We've designed roundabouts with the free right turns, and uh, they're... They shouldn't be put everywhere, but where you have a heavy right turn volume, uh, we think they're great. Uh, but they are more expensive. They take up right of way, so it's a design decision. It's cheaper than trying to put a multi-lane roundabout in, so I think they definitely make sense in the right situations. Uh, there are some more design aspects to think about, how you're moving bikes through there, where you're moving your pedestrians through. So a lot more design elements with it, but when done properly, it, it does increase the capacity. Okay, uh, back to the traffic circles, talking about 10-foot circles with yield approaches. Uh, the yield approaches would be good. I think related to the 10-foot circle, not sure if that's diameter rate or radius, that doesn't really even matter, but you want to make sure as the vehicle is going around that basically that circulating lane going around the circle is 11, 12 feet wide. You don't want it uh, to be 20 feet wide as a circulating lane, you want it to be just for a single vehicle, and you need to make the, tr the circle in the middle uh, so larger trucks, fire engines, those kinds of vehicles can drive over it in that situation. That's probably a key is making sure your, your larger vehicles can get through the intersection because that's the last thing you want is for them to get stuck or jackknife a truck, something like that. Okay. Uh, existing three-leg intersection with 900, 200, 100 AM, and then about the reverse in the PM peak, heavy commuter traffic, would we want a roundabout there? And that's a... Well, that's right on the edge. That is right on the edge because you're, the 900 is pushing the edge of a single-lane roundabout. Um, and it's the unbalanced flow that we're looking at there. So you're going to have 
your AM and P, they're obviously reversed, but you have a dominant flow that's coming through that, um, yeah. you know, the, the problem with that is people in the dominant flow, if they don't see much traffic from the side streets, they stop yielding, they start just moving through and it creates a whole host of issues on the roundabout. So, um, yeah, I think you actually have to get into some capacity analysis to see if one, if those minor movements are going to dominate, take over the commuter routes and cause queuing on the commuter routes. Um, my gut reaction is signals a signal is going to win that one. Um, but with that much through traffic, you probably are not going to be able to get uh, get away with just a side street stop sign. Yeah, that one. Th the, right those the volumes, <laughs> those would be the red flag for me that says this needs a lot more thought. It's not a slam dunk putting a roundabout in there. Okay. Uh, another question, difference in capacity of a dog bone versus two full roundabouts at an interchange. Um, I actually like the dog bone design because you, you typically don't have, um, or you have lower volumes in between, so you can sometimes get to that situation we were just talking to where there's not much uh, traffic you have to yield to for one direction. So if you don't have, if you're not expecting much traffic to come through in between them, mm -hmm. uh, why not close that off and just formalize it that there, it's it's not really a yield there; it's a slowdown point. Yeah, and you're typically not closing off heavy movements with that right. dog bone in the middle. Right, and they can still get around. They just got to, it just takes Take them out of their way a few hundred feet or yeah. however far it is. So, so um, I don't know of intersect, I don't know of <laughs> research related to it, um, but I think it's it would be an interesting just run the capacity analysis. And if there isn't much difference, I would be in favor of the dog bone just as a simplifying yeah. measure. Anecdotally, I would think um, there's not much difference in a in the capacity between the two but I just operationally as you think about it uh, I think the dog bone can work better yep okay scroll what about ped flashers with audio versus full signals um, you you're still having to stop the traffic on the approaches if there's a pedestrian um, so even whether it's a traffic signal or more of a hawk signal that's just stopping traffic because of a pedestrian, you're this, still disrupting flow. And this one is kind of related to our next one. It talks about can visually impaired people be legally moved out of roundabouts, cross them nearby. I like that idea of having more of a mid-block crossing and trying to take them away from the intersection, particularly if you have land uses on either side that you're linking. So it's... It's not like you're diverting them mm -hmm. a, a large distance. Uh, I'm not sure about the legality of it. I would think if, uh, like I said, if you're if you're linking two sites, making it closer, uh, I don't know how you could be at fault there. You're you're making a better. Yeah, and I think this is actually a very underutilized tool in our toolbox is putting in mid-block crossings. Um, and I don't even think you have to put signals, hawk signals at all of them. Um, that in a lot of scenarios, especially if we had more roundabout corridors, the skinny roads, wide nodes mentality. Yeah. If we were starting over 200 years ago <laughs> and thinking roundabouts <laughs> the whole way, I, I think there'd be a lot of discussion around more bid block crossings. All right. Heard of a driveway being another leg to a roundabout. Do you have any experience with this? Yes, I have seen that, so, and I believe it works. Um, but it comes down to the design and fitting in the geometry and, again, making sure all those fastest paths within that roundabout are all in that plus or minus 20 mile per hour range. So it's, it's a more complicated design. It's not just the cookie cutter drop the circle <laughs> in the middle. The other caution I would say for this one is that if it's a driveway for a single home uh, you have very little traffic coming out of there and you're going to get back to what we were talking about before where the majority yeah. of traffic just ignores the yield and goes right by them so if, if it's a driveway to an apartment building something like that uh, I could see that more than I could see a driveway to a single home 
uh, best volume ratio between Main Street and Secondary Street for considering the installation of a roundabout at a particular intersection. Uh, that gets back to the earlier question of when do these break down, um, but really uh, the ideal circumstance for a roundabout is oh. balanced volumes. Yeah, 50-50. Yeah, <laughs> so 50-50 would be ideal um, between the major and the minor approaches, in which case you wouldn't have a major and a minor. <laughs> they right. would all be equal. Well, that's where you could look at always stop. If you have an always stop intersection, you can be pretty certain that a roundabout will work as well or better than what's there. I mean, the, the always stop also works with balanced traffic. So they're very similar in that regard. Okay. Then our last question here, uh, do you plan to do a presentation analyzing a specific roundabout that was problematic? Uh, up until 30 seconds ago, no, but, <laughs> but, but we will consider that, William. Um, I think that's really could be getting too much in the weeds for what we're trying to accomplish with Traffic Corner Tuesdays, but we're going to think about that one. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be an interesting one. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, uh, for helping us have another successful Traffic Corner Tuesday, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks when we are covering convenience stores.